Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Daryl Brooks Saga. On today's episode, we're gonna finish the uh, Mrs. Miss Doro's comments, uh, the, the last comments, and we're gonna go also to the sentencing. So stick by, it's gonna be a long episode, grab something to eat and enjoy the, enjoy it. Uh, the, the, the video, the original edit for this video is gonna be in the description below. Shout out to Yas yes, Antonio for making the, the edit. So let's get right into it. Which I believe is the equivalent of being present. What I will, what I have referred to at times during this trial as the functional equivalent of being present in this very courtroom. Notice how attentive he is right now. Like he is just like sitting there. He doesn't need the headphones. He's just listening to what she has to say because he has no other choice. But it is important that I go through this without interruption to make the record that I need to make. Backtrack. No, you're not muted, sir. You're gonna listen to me and you're not gonna interrupt. So, I so now when after the last episode, he said that she was like, get me out, throw me out. She threw him out and now he wants to go back in, <laughs> but that's not how it works. I, I want to, I don't want to call it a tangent, but I'm looking for a note that I made. See, he only wants to disturb the process. He, he doesn't really care about the, what she has to say. Like, he only wants to, to be there, back there, be able to yell at her in person and then come back. Then you need to pledge to this court, sir, that you will not interrupt me despite what you may not like me saying. Yeah. Can you do that? No. I would like to exercise my right to be present. All right. He's not making that pledge. And under <laughs> Illinois versus Allen, unless he makes that pledge, he's not coming back into this courtroom. Are you you no. are not. All right, clearly he's going to keep repeating that statement, so I have muted him at this point. Yeah, and that's not even the, the phrase that he has to say. He has to say, I would like to reclaim my right to be back because he lost it by his conduct, and now he needs to reclaim it, not, not exercise it, reclaim it. Um, it was my hope that he would honor the simple rule of courtesy and decorum that he show respect to this court to these proceedings and not interrupt and talk over me but that clearly is something he is unwilling or unable to do when testimony or statements by the court or statements by the prosecution team uh, become unfavorable to him he lashes out and he disrupts and that has been borne out time after time after time during this trial. One of the things that I did note regarding Erica Patterson's testimony, because frankly, I wasn't sure where Mr. Brooks was going to go with his own defense based on some of the remarks he made during um, his opening statement, which was actually later, but I guess I'll go back to my review of his um, recorded interview and some of the things that he tried to say and at least it became apparent ultimately um, with the way he cross-examined witnesses I wasn't sure if he would claim perhaps someone else was in the vehicle he was afraid of police the tinting of the windows some of those things yeah no one knows what his defense was supposed to be like he does he didn't have an angle he tried to go different route like maybe there was someone on the back of the vehicle maybe my car didn't work or something like that he but it was never like a focus strategy of what he wanted to prove he tried with every witness the only thing that he tried was catching people on a lie and they were not lying they were there there was no way that they could have lied and they also didn't have any any reason for lying or trying to incriminate him. They didn't know him. They didn't care about him. They could, he could have been doing the same thing that he wanted to do. But he is he he, he 
he inserted himself in that situation. Here's where it frankly doesn't matter. Okay, Erica Patterson provided key testimony in this regard that there was no one else in the vehicle with Mr. Brooks. And I'm aware that he wants to come back, but until he writes me a pledge that he will not interrupt me under Illinois versus Allen, he is not coming back in this courtroom. I'm not, he has forfeited his right to be present during my remarks. And unless he makes that pledge to me in writing, he's not coming back in. Good. One of the things I tried to do in my preparation, and let me tell you, I reviewed all of my notes from this trial. I have, I think, nine notepads. I looked at just a couple of exhibits, but primarily uh, the map, Exhibit 15. I really wanted to determine for myself how long this carnage took. We know the distance, right? Um, from at least where he entered. And you know what, Madam Clerk, put my um, screen up, will you? I'm gonna put exhibit 15 up because I think it's worth doing that. All right. We know he entered from White Rock where the first star is on the right side where it says Fleet One, a marked sedan and marked SUV. Um, and that's where Detective Casey was. And so we know he goes one, two, three blocks before striking anyone. And then it's really about five blocks of what can only be described as chaos and carnage. We know we have from the evidence and the testimony two different speed calculations. One from Bosco's, that was the surveillance footage, between 33 and 34 and a half miles per hour. And then we have one farther down from the footage from Curry Insurance, where it was an average 32 miles per hour. Now, I acknowledge math is not my strong suit. I did not do a calculation, but I don't think it took very long for all of this to happen. I think it was a matter of minutes. I think five minutes would even be far too long. It's probably three, maybe. And it was somewhat hard to gauge during the trial because of how the state presented, and I don't mean this as a criticism, but they were very meticulous in showing video, breaking it down, showing it at half speed, sometimes 30% speed, to really get an understanding of what was happening. And at no point did anyone ever tell me or tell the jury how long this took. And it must have been less than two minutes because it's just five blocks and he was going out, he was going really fast. So it could have been like two minutes at most. But even though it took just a couple of minutes, there were so many opportunities for Mr. Brooks to simply stop, turn around, turn down other streets before he ever crossed Barstow Avenue. And what we know is that at 437, Detective Tom Casey had the first police encounter with Daryl Brooks. came face to face, Detective Casey at the hood of the car, coming eye to eye, that SUV brushed past him. And here's the thing, Detective Casey said he wasn't going very fast. To me, that tells me he had ample time to reflect about what he was about to do. Three blocks. He had three out of those eight blocks to stop. Just stop. That's all he had to do. Just stop driving. That's it. If you look on that map, it's not a pledge. He's not coming in. Good. When you come down White Rock, you can take a hard left on East Main Street. You can take what I call a soft left. I believe it's Pleasant Street. And Detective Casey, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I can't see it on the map. 
frankly, you can turn around at any point in time on White Rock Avenue. But instead, and I, I think if you all try to picture this, as difficult as it may be, there's squads with lights, there's barricades. I know I read in, a, in the other act's motion that Mr. Brooks claimed at one point he was having a panic attack and he, again, maybe I think he was going to claim at some point he was afraid of police. Why drive toward them? Why take that? And now the Rex's doing the boogie dance, the, the, the return dance for him to be able to go back. Like, I think people are going to mock him in prison doing this movement. Right hand Look turn. There's no reasonable explanation other than he was angry, he was full of rage, and he didn't care who he came in contact with, what he came in contact with, whether he drove past, through, at, he drove. Yep. Detective Casey pounded on the hood of that car, saw his face, again, was brushed by that SUV, thankfully not hurt. All of this preceded by the visual signs along White Rock Avenue of the staging of this parade, floats, bands, banners, signs, people. And as you got closer to Main Street, the spectators lining those streets, which um, both, I believe, Detective Casey and Sergeant Warner said were thousands of people. Before he ever gets to Barstow Avenue, he comes in contact with, after Detective Casey, Officer Buttrin, and Officer Schneider. He has an opportunity, if you look at this map, he could go right on Buckley. Again, there might be police, there might be barricades. You simply stop. You ask, can I get out? No doubt in my mind, any police officer there would have done just that. He could have gone left on North East. See what he's doing up here? Like, he's trying to say, take me back in. Take me back in. But that doesn't work. She told you, expressively told you the instruction that you need to pledge. And I don't know what, why he doesn't do it. Like, I don't know why he doesn't write on the paper, I pledge to not interrupt and then interrupt anyway. What, what else he has to lose? You know? East Avenue. Continuing down, he could have gone left on Martin Street. Continuing on, Barstow Avenue. This is where the parade participants, unfortunately, he's, he has contact with them. But he could have gone right on Barstow. He could have gone left on Barstow. And we know from some of the footage that we saw that his car was seen flying past, true not hitting one at this point, but flying past. There's no logical understanding for Mr. Brooks other than he's in the middle of a parade and he's about, he can see them. Anyone driving a vehicle would see what's ahead. And we know from this map, right, what was ahead of him. We saw that video footage, we heard the testimony. Many police vehicles at these intersections with their lights flashing. There's no doubt in my mind that Mr. Brooks would understand a parade was going on. We also know it was not yet dark. Dusk. This was from the battalion chief. But it doesn't matter if it was dark. Like we saw in the trial, the, the car was, uh, the, it had the high beams on. So he doesn't say that he didn't see 60 people. He didn't, he did not see 60 people in front of him. He had the high lights on. So it doesn't matter. It could have been the middle of the night with no um, lights, uh, artificial lights in, in the street. And even with the, with the high beams, you could see someone in front of you, like very far in front of you. Who talked about when he arrived after that first alert at 439 it was not yet dark it was dusk i think that aids to the visibility that mr brooks would have seen 
all of these people. This is not under cover of night. It's, of course, downtown Waukesha. We saw city lights in many of the street lights I'm referring to in many of the videos as well that would have been on or coming on. We know just past Barstow, he strikes his first victim, Nicole White. She was with Remax Services with the hot air balloon. If anyone's seen that, we saw it in the video, that is unmistakable what that is. That would get anyone's attention. If this was a mistake, if he was lost, this was his very first opportunity to stop and do the right thing after causing injury to a person. But he didn't. He did not stop. And then, of course, the Walker's self banned. It's hard not to think about what I watched and not have this reaction. Those were images that frankly kept me up at night that I saw over and over and over. For their band director, she is a hero to me to get up on the stand to talk about, and that was Sarah Waymeyer Arparicio, to identify each one of her students, talk about their formation, Talk about what she saw. So strong for all of you. Mr. Brooks had another opportunity to stop. Yeah, the, I haven't seen the videos. I only seen what it what is shown on on the on the trial. But yeah, I cannot imagine watching all those kids just get rammed by this guy. It's it's maddening. It's, it's, it's it makes you it makes you it makes me mad. Just thinking about that. And he just sitting there like this is all against him. This wasn't one isolated person that he could claim. I didn't know I struck someone. This was driving over people. What Kyle Jewell described as the SUV went over people like they were big old speed bumps. I know the green children were injured around there. Thankfully, their physical injuries were minor, and I know I could probably spend a long time talking about the injuries of the band members, and I'm not going to go through that. They were significant. It was horrific. Thankfully, none of them were killed. Moving on to burst logistics. Uh, between the band and the Blazers, that is where Kelly Graybaugh... Yeah. And He's asking, am I muted? <laughs> am I muted? Your Honor, am I muted? Yes, Honor you are. Adelia were in that adorable Cindy Lou Who costume. And what struck me, and Kelly referenced this in her statement yesterday, was seeing the tires go past her head after she was hit. Adelia had major injuries as well. And then, of course, the footage from the Waukesha Blazers. And Jeff Rogers talked both at the trial, he testified, and he gave a statement yesterday about, again, having to come into this courtroom, talk about all of those who were with him, who were injured, and, of course, little Jackson Sparks, another video that, frankly, is very difficult to watch and hard to unsee. You heard not only... Jeff, but Josh Craner talk about what happened, and Josh, of course, being struck. And then the extreme dance group. And I didn't fully understand the extent of their injuries until hearing from many of the victims yesterday. I now understand why one of the girls called her aunt and said, my entire team is dead, because that's what it looked like. It was horrific. And to think of those two brave young ladies who got up during this trial to testify, 
about what they saw, what they did. Jamie and Alyssa, your dancers are proud of you. And because of you, justice has been served. We heard from others, spectators, Deborah Ramirez, regarding herself and her son. A moment that sticks out to me was really Mr. Brooks trying to chastise her for not seeking medical attention right away. Yeah, she was like, why did you leave your kids before going to the hospital? It was because she needed, she has other kids too. The, the, the injury wasn't that severe and, you know, he, he, he was always so mean to the, all the witnesses. Her response was perfect. She waited due to the number of injured and all the blood she saw. Understandable. Not something to be chastised for. And then moving on, and again, I know I'm not mentioning everybody. These are just some of the highlights that, and I should call them low lights, not highlights, but some of the testimony and evidence that really, really impacted the court. Stephanie Bone Steele and her husband testified about what Citizens Bank was doing, uh, hearing the impact against Jane, a very large thud and an audible gasp from the crowd. Her husband, Adam, was driving the support vehicle. And when he was being cross-examined about why he didn't see the driver, again, he just simply said, I thought it was my wife that had been hit. All I saw was the red poncho. Yeah, can you imagine Mr. Bonesteel? Like, like we, we hear him from him, like just thinking about that could have been my wife. And he wasn't going to be looking at who hit her wife. He was just going, he went, he stopped the vehicle and went straight to the person. Because even though it wasn't his wife, he, he wanted to see if that person was okay. And the only time we ever heard about brake lights was when Jake Kulik was on that vehicle and he braked so he could get her off the top and run her over. And run her over. We heard from Matthew Harris, who talked about the red SUV coming straight at them and then veering and going in the direction of the dancing grannies. What I wrote down from his testimony is he's a combat vet, and this is what he said. I've never saw anything like this in such a safe area. It's at this point, I believe that Owen was struck, Kelsey was struck, Probably another miracle given the injuries she sustained with a tear in her spleen, significant road rash, cuts, requiring facial surgery. What Mr. Knapp described the driver as having eyes completely wide open. And then next we heard from Laura Thien, one of the dancing grannies. This is the this is the last I I I really I think about about this point when he got to the dancing grannies I think some people have said this in the comments and that this is where he started to enjoy it this is where he didn't really care anymore and he he tried to hit as many people as possible because both the dancing grannies and the Catholic uh, group those were I think the the worst. One of the, well, all of them were bad, but I think that, that was the deliberate worst impacts from him. She talked about the sisterhood. Another brave woman came in, talked about what happened to that group. Seven people injured from her group, four fatalities. She said it all happened in a matter of seconds. All I seen was bodies. It looked like a war. The six people who were killed suffered multiple blunt force traumatic injuries, severe, significant, some dying instantly. I was impressed by both Dr. Scheel and Dr. Bizricki, Dr. Bizricki for her attention to detail, her looking at that vehicle, inspecting it, 
looking at the heights where certain damage was done and it being consistent in height with the individuals that she did the autopsies on. And of course, Dr. Scheel and both of these individuals have- Look at this, she's just staring. I, I think th those were the eyes that they described when he was driving, like staring straight ahead, just mindlessly doing what he was doing. Justified before me, but Dr. Scheel, very shaken from the autopsy of little Jackson Sparks. We then, continuing on, heard from Father Witter, saw an SUV flying down the road, heard thuds. It was faster than anyone in their right mind would be going. And then Lucas Hallmark, the off-duty police officer who was walking with his family on that day. You could feel it was palpable when he testified about having the wherewithal to try to get his kids out of the way, throwing his three-year-old as far as he could out of the way. You could see the pain on his face when he talked about not being that successful with his seven-year-old. He said, I wasn't quick enough. He testified that he thought this was a terrorist act, that SUV did not stop. And then, of course, the vehicle inspection by the state patrol, finding no mechanical issues. There was also the Franklin assistant chief who attended the parade. He was near West Main Street in Maple. He provided the testimony regarding the SUV, the window being open. Okay, so we move. We we passed the point where he was. She was talking about the victims, but I want to remark that he was charged of, I think it was 60, 70, around 70 charges of hitting people with a car. And yes, I, I agree that those are the ones that were injured. But I would also like to tell, I would also like to say that all the other people around them, they also are victims. They, he endangered everyone in that parade. And then... He leave a scar in the mind of everyone there. And I think he should pay for that as well. And the driver sticking his head out, looking out. He testified how he thought perhaps it was either a medical emergency, maybe even a mechanical issue, but it was clear once that SUV passed him and he saw that driver, he saw you, Mr. Brooks, no panic, no distress. Do you see that eye rolling? He just he just rolled his eyes. He was like, uh, I don't consent to being called that name. You know this. His heart sank. He knew it was not a medical emergency. The body language just didn't fit. It did not believe it was mechanical at that point either. And then he saw the vehicle crank to the right. As he testified, he seemed excited about what he had done. Another off-duty police officer, this one from Wauwatosa, <clears throat> talked about how he saw Mr. Brooks after the fact crash the vehicle, hear him yell out an expletive and run southbound. With his sweatshirt still on, we all saw that video. Of course, at one point, Officer Skolton had contact. And as he testified, he put things together. Keep in mind all of the radio traffic, right? About one person, then like 15 people, and another 15. It was very apparent to him that although he was on the far end, he was around the dog leg on Wisconsin and Maine, that a vehicle had driven through the parade he saw this vehicle. Of course, at that point, it was heavily damaged. He made the decision to use deadly force. What did he do after? What did Daryl Brooks do after? And I would like to say to that point is that the only reason why that guy missed, like he hit the car three times, but the only reason why he didn't 
like really hit Daryl Brooks was because he was trying to line up the shots so they didn't pass him and hurt someone else. That's the only reason why I think he missed. If he would have just go for it, he would have get get him. But he he thought about the safety of the other people behind the car. So uh, kudos to him. I, he's a hero in this in this uh, case. After we crashed the vehicle, he fled the scene in a hurry. He changed his appearance, took off his sweatshirt loses his shoes i think in a hurry to get out of there not caring that they had fallen off he puts his hair up we saw that on a number of videos he asked unsuspecting people to use their phone to call an uber all within minutes of all of this happening he was in such a hurry to get out of there he left his phone in the suv he calls his mother who arranges for an uber we heard from the uber driver it was a lift, but it's that splitting hairs. He never showed up. It was nearby, ultimately, where he was found. And then, of course, the ring footage of his contact with Daniel Ryder. That is at 5.01 p.m. Minutes. Minutes after all of this happened. Mr. Ryder was astute. Noticing that after Mr. Brooks being in his home for maybe eight to nine minutes, he saw squads driving by. I think you could say his gut told him something wasn't right. And he had Mr. Brooks go onto the porch, of course, after having given him a sandwich, given him a coat to wear, ultimately asks him for his coat back. And then, of course, the arrest. This is where some of the lies become evident. Some. <laughs> there were a lot of lies. <laughs> Mr. Brooks claims ultimately when he's being interviewed by Detective Carpenter, um, they have to actually seek medical clearance for him because he claims that he was thrown to the ground when he was arrested. He was not. The video is very clear. He cooperated. He laid down. There was no use of force used at all to at take all. him into custody. But we know ultimately that he lies about what he was doing in Waukesha, where, how he got there, who he was with. He lies about having contact with Erica Patterson the day before. And this shows how dumb he is. Because he's been having trouble with the law since... All since it's a long time criminal, this guy. So... At this point, you should know that they have access. When, when they have access to your phone, they can know where you've been. Like the, your phone, even though they, the, your phone has a GPS tracker. And they can know where roughly where you've been through the day. They can know by security cameras where you've been. Like there's a ton of, we're not, we're not invisible anymore. Like he was selling, ah, they, they, they stomp, stomp me to the ground. And he didn't remember that police wear body cams nowadays, that everything that they do is pretty much public. Like, he's, he's really dumb. We know when he's found, he has the Ford key credit card, not only in his name, but one, whether it's a credit card or like a benefits card, but it's in the name of Erica Patterson and, of course, an ID for himself, a state-issued ID. Yeah, he also stole Erica's foot stamp cart the ford itself is registered in his mom's name it's the same address that's on his id and there was documentation found in the ford escape he's now in custody he's taken to the substation ultimately taken to waukesha memorial hospital what's notable about the video and audio clips that this court reviewed from the hospital, Mr. Brooks is calm. He's coherent. There's no obvious signs of impairment, no obvious signs or really any signs of mental distress. He makes statements that he's not from the area. He doesn't appear disoriented or confused. At some point, there's kind of a jovial atmosphere between him and one of the detectives. Yeah, he even eat, ate his hamburger. like. His last meal, 
per se. Like he, the last food that he had outside of jail was a fish sandwich for McDonald's, I believe that it was. Can you imagine living your life thinking that was the last real meal that you had before going to jail forever? The next day, he lies to Detective Carpenter, denies driving to Waukesha. I got a ride. He makes up the story about a tan Kia. He's very nondescript and vague with the information that he provides. And over the course of those five hours, he never once references the parade. He never once says there was another driver. Of course, they start talking to him initially about the domestic altercation because by that time, it's very clear a link had been made between Erica Patterson and the call uh, that police originally received of the domestic or at least an altercation near Frame Park and Mr. Brooks. We also know because of the bond conditions in the two felony cases, he's not supposed to have any contact with her at all whatsoever, but he does. At no time during the five hours on November 22nd, does he make any admissions? Does he show any concern for any of the victims? No empathy, only lies, only concern for himself, for his family. Can I have a phone call? He does not provide, and I said this already, the name of anyone else that could be driving that vehicle. At one point, Detective Carpenter says, one of two people drove through the Waukesha Christmas Parade. Either a God-fearing person who screwed up or the malicious guy. Daryl Brooks' response is, don't spin it. One of the things that has become abundantly clear throughout this trial, Daryl Brooks... Just before that, when he was... All the time when he was talking about this God-fearing man. No, you don't fear God. You don't really believe in God. You believe in the concept when he benefits you. But no, nah, you, you don't live by the word that he says. I'm sorry. But that's, that was never the case. He understands exactly what he's doing. His comprehension is fine. Yeah. I have absolutely no concerns and have never had any concerns throughout this case and throughout this trial or even through the past day and a half regarding his competency. He's intelligent, he's deliberate, he's purposeful. He made nuanced arguments during this trial, one about the right to counsel versus the right to the assistance of counsel. That's a sophisticated legal argument, not the product of someone who doesn't understand. He asked questions on cross regarding tint, horns. Um, he brought up the recall after the fact. He talked and asked questions about, I should say, question about barricades, police being at the intersection. Although we never fully understood what his defense was, what became very apparent to me as I reread through all of my notes is that from the very beginning, he wanted to argue jury nullification. If you go back to his opening statements, he talked about power and the jury doing the right thing. He repeated that theme during his closing statement. At one point, he objected to evidence based upon a violation of one of the court's pretrial rulings. Again, a pretty sophisticated objection that resulted in the court striking an exhibit that had previously been received. Today, he spent close to two hours talking on his own behalf without any notes. He covered a variety of topics. Yeah, he's not, like, he's dumb in many ways. I'm not, I'm never going to say anything different than that. But he knows what he does. I think that's, that's the best way to put it. Even though it's wrong, even though it's foolish, he knows what he's doing. I want to talk next about, here's my note that I found. One more thing on Mr. Brooks. You know, at times, right, we've seen the eye rolling, the fake clapping, the laughing, hand gestures, 
many times and most times very emotionless, unless he's doing those things, which would be really inappropriate and are inappropriate. His reactions are largely negative when things are not going his way. What did this community suffer as a result of this tragedy, this malicious conduct by Mr. Brooks? Well, I think many of the victims who spoke said it best. Lori Lockett described it as this, a sense of personal safety you robbed from us. I believe it was Bill Mitchell who said, the only life he seems to value is his own. Jason referred to it as evil. And he talked about innocence being stolen. He called the defendant a coward. He is. No remorse. What he said is, you look like a monster. You look disrespectful to court and witnesses. You look like a callous jerk. He is. Like, I cannot imagine because he said sometimes that this is not who I am. The one, the guy that you see in court right now when the cameras are rolling and you are here, that's not me. That's a facade that I put on to shield myself. And I don't believe that's the truth. He is like that. They, it shows his real colors all the time. But I forgive you. Margaret talked about the mental, physical, and emotional toll this has taken. She talked about how it was so tra traumatizing that her mind won't let her see everything that has happened and that she's worried when her mind might allow her to do that. I'm thankful that she's 95% back to normal. Jeff Rogers also commented on the lack of remorse and sympathy for the victims. He talked about how his son, Caden, was so concerned for his younger sister. I'm really glad Riley is okay. I believe that was from the day of the parade and how he recognized he was inches away from losing three of his four kids just because of where they were located. He had flashbacks of grabbing his daughter's jacket, missing the first time, but that Riley gets up sometimes six, seven, eight times a night we heard next from Jessica and Juan, and their, how this impacted them, the loss of their, son, their son's friend, Jackson, and how, I believe it was Jessica who said, I yelled stop, I put my hands out as if I had the power. How she saw Jackson and how she will forever have that image burned in her memory. Many people talked about PTSD. I mean, for her, I was really struck by how difficult it has been by, because of what she saw, not able to be a teacher, how she's hypervigilant, and every- He's gonna try to write again, but he's not gonna pledge. I'm, I'm sure he's not gonna pledge. Sound sends her into a panic how her joy has been stolen. She commented on the lack of remorse by Mr. Brooks and that he seems to search only for sympathy for himself. She said it, he will always be a danger to society. The sights and sounds of the SUV plowing through, the impact to her and the kids, the nightmares, how parking lots are problems, there's panic attacks that no one will ever be the same. Of course, we heard next from the Sparks family. They're hurt, angry, they're traumatized, they're broken. It was difficult to even watch them make their statements. Their hurt is palpable. She talked about her last hug with Jackson. The horrible sounds she heard. She saw a police officer holding Jackson. She 
went to Tucker and that her world came crashing down. She talked about how she found a hat, both boys' hats, then shoes. And I didn't realize how significantly Tucker had been injured until she described that for us yesterday. How Tucker somehow blames himself for his brother's death. It's not your fault, Tucker. It's Mr. Brooks's fault. One of the things when there is a fatality, <laughs> you know, now now that she's that she's talking about Tucker and uh, Jackson, he he has to pray now, because that that's the one I think of all of the victims that they that he hurt, I think Jackson is the one that he 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 actually feels something. It's not pain, it's not remorse, but he. He feels something about Jackson Sparks, but it's not enough. With all of these victims is the future that is robbed from them, right? No future weddings, no future graduations, no future grandchildren or children, no plans. It's just gone. It's all memories. And the contrast, the contrast with, frankly, what Mr. Brooks will have, and that is even a life in prison, he'll make memories, he'll have phone calls, yeah. he'll have visits. He may even get to hug the people that he loves again. For the six individuals who lost their lives, that will never, ever be a reality. No, and not, not only the six individuals, their whole families, hundreds of people are now missing those loved ones. And that this family also talked about the lack of empathy, lack of remorse, no apology. I'm aware Mr. Brooks wants to come back. It says, I don't intend to interrupt in any way. That's not a pledge. He needs to pledge that he will not do so. I need that word in that statement. And if he does that, I'll bring him back in. <laughs> Look at this. Look at the, this frown. He's like, what? I'm going to try to go a little bit faster. Some of the comments. <laughs> the yells and screams from that night will haunt me for the rest of my life. I'm asking the court to give the max for each conviction because he has given the community a life sentence of these memories. Yes. I think it was Tyler's mom who talked about the community rising like a phoenix. You clearly have a phoenix for a son. He's strong. He got me a little bit with his comments. Wasn't expecting that. You're an amazing young man. You're a picture of resiliency. A fortitude of strength. I think what this community needs. And then we next heard from Sasha. Who's haunted by survivor guilt. My heart breaks for her. She talked about feeling empty, how she couldn't play soccer because her kicking leg would hurt from the injuries she sustained. She has difficulty sleeping, struggles with nightmares. Physically and emotionally, she feels stuck. She talked about maybe law school being in her future. And to her, I say, Good. don't give him the satisfaction of holding you back. Jen Dunn read a statement from Sasha's mom, and I wrote this down. No one knows what it's like to stand on your feet when there is no floor. That's a pretty powerful image. I think that's very apt for what this community has gone through. We heard from others, including the Teagues. We saw photographs. 
so many families with more than one individual who was injured. We heard a lot about night terrors and again, PTSD and trauma. One of the individuals talked about humor is good medicine and I would echo that. Yeah, I, I also agree with that. I, I know I know sometimes when I ever read in the trial and, and even, even in this video, I, I've been laughing at Brooks. And I think that's for me, that's the best way to disarm a monster. When you don't give him that, you don't give him sadness, you don't give him feeling beating you down. Like you go back to his face and laugh at him because he's a joke. And I think that's a, that's a big, that's a, that's a good medicine for everyone. We heard about one band member who, whose instrument may have very well saved his life. Someone described it as a mental massacre though, the aftermath of this. It's difficult to go downtown. It's difficult to get restful slumber. Panic, panic attacks are common. Describe Mr. Brooks as sheer evil in its vilest form. Yes. I wrote down that despite all of the impact and carnage, many people talked about forgiveness, brokenness, sorrow, anger, hatred, regret. A lot of emotions, frankly, really no emotion shown by Mr. Brooks, certainly not for what he did on November 21st. We saw a lot of anger for some of the people who lost loved ones, and understandably so. Many families were devastated. Nannies and grandmas were taken away. Yes, there were very specific terms used to describe Mr. Brooks, that in their opinion, he's a monster, he's a demon. Pure, unrepented evil was one of the phrases that were used. It's true. Talked about the system failing us. Saw you in your SUV hanging out with a smile of satisfaction on your face. For one of Leanna Owen's sons, I lost my mom. I wasn't always a good son. You can hear, right, the regret in that statement because life is short and these lives were taken far too short. We heard the very gracious, gracious statement from Michael Carlson, who unbeknownst to me had been writing Mr. Brooks in jail and share, sharing the gospel and the love of Jesus. He read a poem, which I thought was beautiful from the standpoint of his sister. And he said this, in that poem, it says, we both died that day. I, Tamara, died to life. You died to the world. And then, of course, the Sorensen family talked next. They talked about never seeing their Grammy again. You murdered my mom. But at least I have some peace knowing she died doing something she loved. We heard from Brooke yesterday and today. She reread her statement due to the interruption. <laughs> Proud of her for getting up here and sharing that. We talked about how compassionate each one of these individuals who died were. We heard about the compassion from Detective Casey that we learned about. It said Detective Casey came to our home to verify what we knew, and he greeted us every day of this trial. They ended with angels watch over us. Six angels watching over us today. They asked me to hold Mr. Brooks accountable so that he will not have the opportunity to hurt anyone ever again. We heard from the Kulik family about the empty space that they have and the brokenness. Their lives being shattered by mom and grandma being taken away. We heard from her youngest daughter. The grief was so palpable, being 17 and in high school as a senior, now a first year in college. 
She talked about all of the things she will never have with her mom. Talked about triggers of their PTSD, sirens, things of that nature. And how she waited. She waited hoping that Daryl Brooks would have a reason. Moving on, Leanne talked about her safety and security being stolen by this defendant. What I love about all this is that she's given Dara Brooks the punishment that he hates the most, which is being ignored. Like, he cannot stand not being in the center of everything. And right now he's so antsy. You can see it in his posture. Like, he wants to talk. He wants to say stuff. But he can't, and that's great. She asked Mr. Brooks to picture his own daughter, unresponsive, lying on the ground with a leg injury, a head injury, and blood coming out of her mouth. She talked about the excruciating two weeks in the hospital, wondering if her daughter would ever live in a wheelchair and then a walker for months. She said this, all you had to do was Stop. hit the brakes. We heard next from the Urell family. I still can't get over how he he actually called Mrs. Urell to the stand. Why? I, I still don't understand why. A family that, of course, was impacted significantly with four of their children, all of their children being struck by the SUV, with the mom, of course, having to testify in this case, being called by Mr. Brooks, which, of course, was his right to call witnesses. But it's the manner in which I think the indifference, not caring that this was someone who had four children impacted significantly, but clearly you're raising your kids the right way. The grace and dignity Charlotte got up and talked about. The basic things you learned in kindergarten. <laughs> she described what she saw as being stupid, delusional, and egotistical. She wanted to punch you in the face, and understandably so. I think everyone can relate to that. I think her words were, your arrogance is pathetic. And her mom echoed those words. We heard from Alyssa, her heart-wrenching statement. She, of course, testified bravely. But you could tell the impact that this had on her and what she saw in the aftermath to the Extreme Dance team. How one of the girls who at 10 years old, even lying on the ground being injured, had the wherewithal to ask, why would someone do this? If a 10 year old knew this, then the defendant knew this. And how she left the hospital not knowing if she would see some of her girls again. She was completely and utterly broken, forever changed by this event. She waited. She talked about how she waited for remorse, for empathy. It didn't happen. Dylan Urell said something very insightful yesterday, something we didn't hear about in the trial, but because of where he was at on the parade route around the corner, waiting for his children. He didn't even know that all of them were in the parade. He said this, you hit the corner, sorry, you hit the brakes to go around the corner. And then you drove through a barricade where an officer shot at you three times. Yeah. Those brakes were working. You knew how to use them. And you selfishly only used them so as to not crash your own vehicle as you fled the scene. Yeah, because if he, if he damaged damage the vehicle, he will damage himself. If that's the only person that he cares about. Talked about walking through and around that corner through the wake of carnage, bodies all over, women, adults, children, deceased, people running all over. We heard from more of the members of the extreme dance team, either directly or parents and loved ones how they had to walk through the carnage to find their children. 
such a gracious statement of love talking to Mr. Brooks about being a Christian and how she prays for him. Very powerful. Thank you for that. Her daughter, equally as powerful and brave and gracious. But even she knew, she said, that I thought about you every day. How could someone do this? How even the song that was playing during the extreme dance team performance is a trigger for her PTSD. And how she's forgiven him. We heard from the sister of victim HH and how the first thing she talked about was the sound of Vivian Urell whimpering, crying, and then she found her sister, how her clothes were ripped off. She was unconscious, half naked. How her sister was in a coma for two weeks, but how she has survivor guilt and issues like that, panic attacks, PTSD. She can't be around fireworks, tire screeching is a trigger that this turned her life upside down. And then of course we heard from victim HH herself. So brave to come here. I'm so very thankful you are recovering. Someone commented on how amazing it is to see the many people with their in recovery. Um, you wouldn't know by looking at them, of course, the emotional and mental Injuries are significant and severe, but so grateful, frankly, lucky to be alive. And I want to say this, like, uh, like listening to that. And I, I said it a few times over the course of the trial and is that the Waukesha people sound awesome. They, they, they seem like really gen genuinely great people that support each other. Like, I don't know. I don't remember how many people are in Waukesha. But it seems like a really tight community that supports themselves and and care about each other. And I think that's that's really great and a really important note to take away from this. I say to you, that scar on your neck should be a sign of strength and fortitude. You fought, you won. You have a story to tell. Don't shy away from it. Of course, we heard from her mother as well. We saw that PowerPoint with the pictures of their journey. The road rash on her face was horrific. You can only get a mental picture from words so much, but to see those actual pictures, her int being intubated and oh, it's heart wrenching. And all of the surgeries and the toll it took on their family but she described her daughter as a warrior. I think all of you here are warriors. Yeah. We heard from Sam and her family and what she went through and how significant her injuries were. And the, her mom talked about the haunting vision she has of just what she saw because of her perspective. Sitting in the back of the pickup truck, she had a seat, a front row seat to horror how she thought her daughter was dead because she was unresponsive and blood and really kind of the chaos and the confusion and not really even being able, being able to articulate what happened over the phone to her husband, asking Mr. Brooks, how could you do this? What kind of father does that? He's not a father, like, no. <laughs> He doesn't care about anyone but himself, even his kids, even Missy, even all of those things that he said about it. That's just to gain sympathy for him. He doesn't really care about his own children. The last person we heard from was a victim. I think it's Gigi, the mother of FF. <laughs> If I have it reversed, please excuse me. And how you could, she, I actually have her written statement that was provided earlier today, but how 
<laughs> no one can read that, Brooks. You need to remark it or something, but no, no one can read that uh, that far. She was so taken aback by the conduct of Mr. Brooks that she frankly called him out on it yesterday. Because I'm he was trying. kind of motioning his hand like, okay, come on, let's get this over with, hurry up. And she yelled at him, you don't care. She goes, you hit me, I saw you, you knew. You're a child killer, you're a woman killer. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't know that I was going to do that. She was but so I, flustered. I, I tried to, uh, I like, get the resolution up so I could um, read it, but it's, uh, it's unreadable. She had to really gather herself before she could continue. No. So again, I want to thank the victims. I have other statements that I've read for people. Um, so gracious. I think they were all members of the Catholic communities. Their statements were translated. Very gracious. Praying for Mr. Brooks. I can't read your sign, Mr. Brooks. Can you hold it up closer? Nope. If it's a pledge that you will not interrupt me, I will bring you in for what will be the final section of my remarks today in the sentencing portion. Well, through the fat, the uh, the sentencing factors, and I can only read the top where it says objection, but <laughs> I can't tell what it is, what it says. He can bring the sign with, we'll clear the courtroom, we'll take a short break, and I will bring him back in. But I will warn you, Mr. Brooks, that there is one interruption, you will go back to that room because you will forfeit your right to be present for the sentencing portion. We'll be in recess until we can get him back in. Thank you. All right, what do you guys think? Put it in the comments. He's going to behave so you can just get this over with or he's going to act out again. Just give me a one in chat. You're going back. Move. Like, <laughs> you hear that? The first thing that he says when the judge is there is like, can I go back to the other courtroom? When, then why do you want to come in? Like, I, th this is what I don't get. Th this is what he was going to do if she stopped and acknowledged what he was going to say. Because that's the only thing that he wanted to do. Go back and then ask to be brought back. The records should reflect that uh, it's 4.53. Mr. Brooks is back in this courtroom. Mr. Brooks, the only way I will honor that request is if you specifically uh, waive your right to do so. Without that, um, that's not a convenience for you over there. It's you go over there when you frankly demand removal under Illinois versus Allen. I demand anything. No, your conduct did. Yes. So you Our can sit. didn't demand anything either. Yes. All right, Mr. Brooks, please sit changing, down. You keep changing. And I'm going to continue with my sentencing remarks. You keep changing the jurisdiction. How can she change the jurisdiction if you don't, if they don't have jurisdiction? So yeah. So what you're admitting right now is that they have jurisdiction over you. Jurisdiction, it's a subject matter jurisdiction that has yet to be proven on a record. In Mr. that Brooks, court and in this one. Please sit down. I would like to go back to the other court. It's not a courtesy. Then why did you ask to be brought back? You could have just sat there and waited. To you, if you'd like to specifically waive your right to be physically present, then I will entertain that. Otherwise, never, you need to sit down. I never waived. To, I never waived the right to not be present. That's because you to... yeah, you forfeited. You didn't waive it forfeited your right I to be present by anything, conduct Honor, you're now wrote, back in this courtroom your honor i wrote three i did what you asked me to do yes you asked to be brought back and now you're back and you want to go into the other courtroom so wh which one is it pick one you, you said, never once pledged to me sir that no, you would not interrupt and you, you're demonstrating by being here that you continue to interrupt yeah Man, I ain't trying to hear all that because at, I ain't trying to hear all that. At the end of the day, I did what you asked me to do. No, she asked you to write a pledge. She told you to specifically wrote in the paper, I pledge to not interrupt. And you didn't do it. You told me, you told the bailiff to tell Mr. me. Mr. Brooks, this is not a debate. You told the bailiff to tell it's me that I It's not a debate. You write. asked to come over here and I honored that. Well, I, and I exercised my right three times. I and shouldn't have here. had to do it three times. And you're here. So what? Shut up and sit down. None of those opportunities that you wrote to me said, 
I pledge to not interrupt. I never had story. to do that before. But you, you have to do it now. What what part of that is hard to understand? He told you to do it now. He, just because he didn't last you before doesn't mean you can't kind of do it now. You've never required that before. That is actually not true, sir. You've never required that before. Every single time that I've been brought over there, after some time, sometimes very short, sometimes an extended Brooks, period of time. You are just simply trying to delay the inevitable. I'm, I'm, Please sit I down. I don't care about the inevitable. I, it was I already written from day one what was going to happen. It doesn't make me lose any sleep. About yes, yes, it does. About that. I know I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay with everything. Then please I just sit want to down. Be, I just want to be treated fairly, which please, I have not been. Please sit down. If you're okay with everything, you're okay with being over there. And then you, Your Honor, and then you Mr. always make it seem this is like not you a always debate. make it seem like it's some type of aim, and it's not. Please sit down. We're talking about constitutional rights. You just told me, or you told the bailiff to tell me that I had to write to exercise a right that I should already have. I did that. Not once, not twice, three times. And it still wasn't honored. And then I, I raised this sign. I'm, I'm Brooks, waving this for like 20 minutes. You're, saying I would, want, I would want to come back. I'm doing this. You're hey, here now. Can I come back? Can I come back? Can so I come sit back? Down. It wasn't honored. And then I, so I, I, I said, can okay, finish. I'll write this and I'll see if your honor can see it on the screen. The objection sign saying, Mr. I've Brooks, exercised my right if to you be stop present. for May a minute, I have the order of the court. I'll explain it, but you have to stop I'm, so I'm not, I can explain I, it. Your Honor, you've never, I did what you asked me to do. Actually, no. Ooh, but no, you didn't ask what you, you didn't, he told you, you have to write the word pledge there. And even in that little thing that he just read, he didn't even do that. So, not. yes, let me explain and, and if, if I you would like. If I didn't, Your Honor. If I did not do what you asked me to do, then why did I? Why was I allowed to come back if I did not do what you asked me? Because to do? I'm frankly going to. Because the attorney said that she uh, pledged to the judge for you that she should give you that opportunity. That's the only reason why you're there. It was a very distinct portion of this hearing where I am going to impose sentence. Okay, that doesn't and answer that the question. Though, matters. Though. It doesn't answer the question. It Please does. sit down yeah. and I will explain and Your remain Honor, quiet with without due, interrupting me. With all due respect. That doesn't mean you're respecting me, you, so please you, sit down. With all due respect, you told the bailiff when I when I first said, oh. because every time that I've been brought over there in the past. You keep saying that, but that doesn't mean anything right now. Yes. Mr. Brooks, you always stated, I don't need a history you always lesson stated of what I've done. That when I exercise my right to be present. Untrue. Untrue. You've Untrue. always said Untrue. we have the record. We have the record. We can dig into the record, Mr. Brooks. I, I know what you. I know what the requirement was of me going in, uh, going over there. You've always stated on the record that when I exercise my right to be present, you will bring me back if I'm if uh, I will follow the rules of decorum. That's it, your exact. And you are not doing it. Back words, which you said every time. Which you're I've demonstrating never, right now that had, you have absolutely. Your no Honor, ability to do with all due respect i've never had to go through any type of certain words that needed to be needed to be said or stressed or anything like that before i've always done it the way that you've asked me to do it no different than today when i told the bailiff i would like to be present you told the bailiff if he wants to be present he has to put it in right and pledge to me it, that he will in, not interrupt me. I put it in writing. Yes, <laughs> that's why. That's that's the thing. He said specifically pledge to not interrupt, and he didn't do that. Without a pledge. So so why am I here? Because I'm going to move on to another phase of this hearing, and I thought it important that you be here in person. So, so I was here, but you didn't reclaim your right to be back here. I, I, why am, I here, am then, your Honor. allowing it to okay. happen. Yeah, that's the thing. This is not because of you. It's because I want it, and if I want it, you're gonna be back there too. Hey, and and I, and I and I respect that you're allowing it, but still, it, it doesn't answer the question, though, Your Honor. He does. It does. You, he always, he's always this way with questions. Like if he doesn't answer something because he said, I don't understand. He's like, you ask me a question and I answer it. I said, I don't understand. That answers your question.
she answers the question with what it actually was, and he's now saying that doesn't answer the question. So which one is it? Does not answer the question. Mr. Brooks. As a, Your Honor, as a public Mr. Brooks. servant, I have the right to ask questions Sir, of Your Honor. I'm going to ask you one more time, and if you refuse to sit down, then you are in direct disobedience of a court order. Sit that down and be quiet so I can make the appropriate can record. You, can you tell me what the, um, the court right, order he's is? He's not going to obey. He's now forfeited did, his right to be present. Obey. He will go you, into the other court. Say, you didn't say that you were not going to obey, but your actions didn't, you didn't obey to the, the thing. So that's, that just means one thing. I wasn't going to obey. We'll be in I just recess asked, until the he's there. I just asked, what is the order? I didn't, I didn't say. Yeah, he's back there. <laughs> And now he's going to be like, can I go back? Thank you. Please be seated. Am I muted, Your Honor? Am I muted? Yes, you are. You're back on the record. The record should reflect that Mr. Brooks is no longer in the main courtroom. He is in the adjoining courtroom. Um, I, of course, have been erring on the side of constitutional caution, but I would note that his right to be present at sentencing is a statutory right. Um, which, frankly, I probably don't need to go through the findings under Illinois versus Allen. Right. Whether it's a statutory right or a constitutional right, you can forfeit that right, and his behavior today has certainly demonstrated that he has forfeited his right to be present in this courtroom uh, during my sentencing remarks. He immediately came in. Um, I was on the bench looking through my paperwork. Uh, the courtroom wasn't even open. Uh, and he started asking me questions. I said I wasn't going to answer them. He really had no respect for the proper decorum. Um, I needed it to be on the record. He d didn't seem to care about that. Um, wanted to debate me about my prior rulings. Uh, bottom line is it's a statutory right for him to be present. And uh, he's forfeited that right. Um, and I would just add that it's part of a pattern that has been demonstrated uh, during this trial that when my perspective, things are not going in his direction, things are being said that he doesn't agree with, uh, that he tends to act out, he disrupts, um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, one of the reasons I really spent the time going through uh, both my observations of uh, Mr. Brooks in terms of the mental health related issues and uh, first and then going through the uh, victim impact statements before I go through all of the necessary factors for sentencing is frankly it's challenging to talk about the impact to the victims without getting emotional. Um, this trial is unlike anything that I've ever been a part of. The sheer magnitude of the crime, the number of people impacted, how they were impacted, the vicious, senseless nature of it, um, and hearing about the impact of all of that on our community members and the people who are at the parade, um, it's heart-wrenching. And um, I wanted to do that before I really got to the meat of sentencing um, because I also thought it was important to really spend some time recognizing and acknowledging the impact to the direct victims uh, who are in this courtroom and who have provided statements. All right. we're Today, gonna, we're going to continue. We're not going to stop. We're going to continue with the sentencing. My focus in sentencing will be about November 21 of 2021. The events shortly before that are leading up to it and after and are not about Mr. Brooks's conduct during this trial, even though case law is very clear that his conduct at trial can and is a legitimate factor for the court to consider, um, I need to make the record very clear that in no way what I do here today is based on Mr. Brooks exercising his right to a trial. That is a 
firmly embedded constitutional right, which I support, which I upheld. Um, of course, every person charged with a crime has a right to a trial. This court honored that right. I protected that right, even if Mr. Brooks treated it with contempt, disrespect, and at times like a game. Yeah, he also did. He, he did all of that. He, he had no... I mean, I get, I get it. I get that it's a right. I get, I get it that you have to, the right to defend yourself. But I, there are some situations where, where he went out of line several times. But he was not fit. He had no. He didn't have the mental power to be able to do that. So that's that's kind of tough on the judge. Um, and I give it some thought. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it here. I'm gonna come back tomorrow with the, with this video. So, so join me tomorrow for the end, the sentence, the nail in the coffin for Dara Brooks. Have a wonderful day. Give it a like if you made it this far. Bye-bye.